Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, we'll be demonstrating for you the features of Corel Aftershock Pro. Uh, my name is Evelyn Watts and uh, I'll be moderating this uh, with uh, a view to answering questions and making sure that we have time at the end uh, for Q&A. Uh, for anyone who is uh, new to this webinar service, notice that in the panel on the right hand side of your screen there is a questions section. Uh, in here, you can actually type in any of the questions that you have, and uh, again, we'll be flagging those. And uh, Jeff, who is our senior product manager for AppShot and who is also demonstrating today, uh, will be answering those for us towards the end. So, uh, just one other note too, uh, we are recording this session, so don't worry, uh, you'll have access to it afterwards. We'll be posting it on uh, our YouTube channel, AfterShot, uh, Corel AfterShot Pro, and uh, you'll be able to review it afterwards. Uh, or um, uh, take a look at any time. So with that, let me hand it over to Jeff Stevens. Uh, Jeff, uh, if you'd like to, feel free to take it away. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, so what I'm going to do is walk through the application here, um, show you how um, the application works, um, some of the bells and whistles in it, uh, introduce you to um, the, the interface, how to get started with it, um, and explain a couple of different um, photo workflows. Uh, workflow means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, and we've designed the application to be very flexible and not require you to use one specific workflow or working style, um, but rather to be very flexible to adapt to however you want to work. So I'll show you a couple of different kinds of workflow, one from more of the professional photographer standpoint uh, and one from more of the enthusiast uh, home user uh, like myself. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, when you start Aftershot Pro, it'll look like this. On the left side of the screen, You'll see tabs for library, file system view, and then output. Uh, this is where you find your images, uh, pick which ones you want to work on, and then do your actual uh, output rendering, creating those uh, final output JPEGs or, or TIFF files. Uh, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail uh, momentarily. Uh, next over is the thumbnail view. You can have a single row of thumbnails. You can have multiple rows of thumbnails. Up in the top right, there are three buttons. Uh, this one switches to thumbnails only. Um, you can also hit F8 to turn that on. This middle one is thumbnails and a preview. F7 is the shortcut for it. Um, or then image only mode is this last one and that's F6. So F6, F7, F8, handy little shortcuts to remember. Um, another thing to note in the preview window, right now we've got one image selected, but if we select two thumbnails here, and click this button in the bottom right for multi-view. You can actually put multiple raw files on the screen at once. So uh, M is also the shortcut key for that, um, M standing for multi-view. Um, so you can quickly pop back and forth between a couple of images. This works great if you're trying to judge between several shots that are similar. Um, I've got a group of photos over here that um, all have uh, similar characteristics. So if you want to pick which one of these, let's find a few more, uh, which one of those is your favorite, you can quickly move between them, zoom in, double click to zoom to 100%, uh, escape gets you back. Um, so very quickly you can uh, move through your photos and, uh, and pick your best ones very quickly. Uh, then on the far right are your image adjustment tools. This is where you actually make adjustments to your images, um, do your editing. Um, all the tools are, are uh, arranged on these tabs over here. You have the standard tab, color, tone, details, metadata, and then plugins. Uh, this black and white plugin ships with the product. Other plugins are available for download. You can install those separately. And as you install them, they will appear on this uh, plugins tab here. Uh, I will bring up a web page very quickly. Uh, if you go to aftershoppro.com slash plugins, uh, you'll get a list of all the plugins that are available, uh, and we'll go into what these plugins are and, and how they work a little bit later. So that's a quick introduction to the application, um, how, the, how the interface is laid out. Uh, now what I'll do is walk through a couple of different workflows to show you um, how folks are actually using the application in their um, either businesses or, or home use and um, show you some of the different ways to, to move through the application. The first workflow that I'll talk about um, is that of a professional wedding photographer. Uh, 
These guys have very specific needs because they shoot a whole lot of photos over a short amount of time and need to pick the best ones, edit those, refine those, get the best looking photos that they can very quickly, and then get them out to the client. And, but once they've finished with that project and, and delivered the photos to the client, they typically don't come back to them later. So the asset management, cataloging, those features aren't quite as important as just being able to move through very quickly, find the best photos, mark them, edit them, and uh, create output files, get them to the client very, very quickly. So that's what we'll do here. We've got a folder selected. I switch to uh, file system mode. This lets me skip the asset management, skip cataloging altogether, because that's not important for this use. So I just, I just clicked on a folder. All the images in the folder came up, and I can start picking the ones that I want to include. Um, some of them are obvious. You'll be able to tell just by the thumbnail that you want to, to include those. Um, some of them uh, you might need to take a little closer look at. So I'll select all four of these, holding down the Shift key as I click the first and the last one. Press F6 to go into image-only mode, and then press M to switch to multi-view. And you can compare all of these images very quickly. And see, that one's... This one's a little bit sharper than this one here. So I think I want to take that one. With it selected, I'll just hit 1. That'll rate that one. And then out of these bottom two, let's see. Um, I, think I, like, uh, I think I like this one better. So I'll give it a one-star rating as well. Um, switch back to my thumbnails. And then we can move on to the next photo. So very quickly, you can move through and, and, uh, and pick the ones you want to include in your final output. You can also use this magnifier if you push uh, the tilde key next to the, uh, next to the one on a, uh, on a US keyboard or view magnifier. You can actually check detail, get a 100% zoom of your photos very quickly to see which one's the sharpest. Maybe you want to include both of these, maybe just one of them. Um, yeah, that one's better. I'll, I'll unrate that one and we'll keep that one. So very quickly, you can move through your photos and select the best ones so you don't have to deal with this whole set of images. You can quickly just say, OK, well, let me filter out just my one star. Uh, down here at the bottom, it says that I have 42 images um, viewed with one or more stars and 165 of them uh, uh, hidden that, that have zero stars. So this is a good way to see um, how you're progressing through your set. If you have 2,000 photos and you know you need to get down to 200, you can quickly toggle on and off this filter, and um, it'll tell you exactly how many you've already got rated. Um, if you need to make another pass, what you can also do is have all the one stars, and then see which ones um, have been rated two or, or more stars. And you know, as you make these changes, the interface updates very, very quickly. Um, everything's very responsive to move you through that work of, of selecting your photos, selecting the best ones very, very quickly. And then with, with um, these images selected, that's when you'd actually start your uh, editing process. To do that, I usually switch to a view um, more like this, where you've got thumbnails and the preview window. And uh, you can move through and start making your adjustments, maybe do a little highlight correction, drop down the exposure a little bit, uh, add a little saturation, anything you need to do to make your images um, look their best. Now we'll get into the detailed editing. Uh, in, in a little bit. But one other feature I want to show you that's very important when you're doing your editing is to uh, be able to edit in batches. Most photographers, especially wedding photographers, shoot in batches. So it makes sense to edit in batches as well. Here we've got a, a number of photos all shot at the same time with the same lighting of the same bride with the same equipment. So any adjustment that I make to one image is likely going to apply to all the other images as well. So it's very easy to uh, make your adjustments to one. We'll just add a little uh, vibrance to make the skin tone really pop, um, a little contrast just to make the overall image have a little bit more impact, maybe drop my blacks down to get a little bit more detail in the shadows. Then we'll go use this uh, third-party plugin called uh, Vinny to add a little creative vignette just about like that. Um, just to kind of focus your eye on, on the middle of the photo, give it that sort of nostalgic feel. Um, okay, that's starting to look good. That, that's exactly what I want these photos to look like. So what I will do is hit Control-C, or you can go to Edit, Settings, um, where is it? Edit, uh, copy Image Settings right there. 
Um, and then what I'm going to do is select my other thumbnails from the same shoot. And I've got a whole group of them uh, selected, and I'll hit Control V. If you watch the thumbnails when I paste, all those thumbnails will take on those exact same characteristics. The vignetting, the saturation, the fill light, um, everything that I did to that first image gets mimicked on all the rest of the photos. So it's very, very easy to move through a huge group of photos and uh, get them to look not only great, but also very similar. If you're actually laying out a wedding album, it's important to have the color characteristics, the tonality, um, the general feel of the photos from one image to the next um, look very similar. If I had uh, adjusted the white balance here to be a little bit more neutral, um, maybe give it a nice little cool cast like that, um, that's a whole different feel and look of the image. And uh, if I had this one printed right next to this one, it would look a little goofy. Um, so I can just hit Control C, move to the next image, hit Control V, and they're going to take on those exact same color characteristics, exact same tonality uh, to make sure that they look great, not only alone, um, but also together. I think I overdid it a little bit of those, so I'll just uh, back off a little bit like that. Um, so that's a great way to move through, edit your photos very fast. Once you've finished your editing, I'm just going to turn back on my filter here, and uh, what we'll do is... Uh, create output files. Um, everything you do in Aftershot is completely non-destructive. So if we take a photo like uh, this one, we can uh, add a little fill light to boost those shadows, maybe add a little vibrance to make the skin tones a little bit better. And then if we do something crazy that we don't really like, we can hit Control Z or Undo to remove that one step very quick and easy, or you can hit Control R um, for Reset to go straight back to the, how the image came straight out of the camera. Those are also on the edit panel, um, edit settings, uh, apply default settings, uh, removes all the settings that you have and, and goes back to the, uh, to the originals. Um, you can also do control Z to get back to where you were. So you can undo, redo, uh, reset entirely um, to make sure you never alter the original image, you never hurt anything. Uh, so you can experiment a lot um, knowing your, your original photo is very safe. Um, that also applies to cropping. If I uh, crop out, let's just do an, a nice little uh, portrait out of, uh, out of this photo uh, like that. So if I crop this image, um, e even the crop is non-destructive. So I can, I can move on, I can go back to my thumbnail view and, and see it, it cropped. This little uh, dotted outline uh, means that this image has a crop applied to it. But maybe I don't like that after all. I just turn, turn off cropping, hit done, and the whole photo's back. So everything that you do, including cropping, um, using plugins, all the built-in tools, totally non-destructive. So once you want to move these photos into another application or email them to your client, uh, put them on Facebook or Flickr, um, or use them in anywhere outside of the application, you'll need to go to the Output tab and convert these raw files to JPEGs. So under this uh, batch output are the list of the um, uh, output batches that, that come with the program. You can customize each one of these, you can uh, add more, you can tune them to exactly how you want to work. This is a great way to really help automate your workflow, uh, make repetitive tasks very, very simple. Um, this one here is pretty simple. It's going to ask where I want to put the photos. Um, it's going to uh, size them as proofs as opposed to normal. What that means is 50% of the width, 50% of the height. Um, it's going to uh, embed some metadata. It's not going to apply any preset or output sharpening, anything like that. Just very basic, simple output batch. Um, so that's exactly what we want to use to deliver these to our client. Um, so I'm just going to hit Control A to select all of them and drag it over here to the JPEG proof batch. It's going to ask where I want to save them and I'll just pick this folder on my desktop called Output um, and hit Go. Then down in the bottom left, you can see it's going to start processing these raw files, converting them to JPEGs really, really fast. And uh, what you'll notice is that as it does that, the application is still very responsive. You can move through your images. As soon as you land on a photo, you can start doing your adjustment. Um, it's very, very quick and responsive, even though it's busy converting these raw files in the background faster than any other application on the market. So very, very quick, very responsive, even when the application is busy. And, um, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's often working. Uh, so that's a very, very quick overview of the pro photographer, um, pro wedding photographer workflow. Um, once they're done with that project, they would just click on the next one. 
um, all those images would appear. Um, I'm filtering only my um, one star images and uh, there weren't any rated so d none came up. You can tell if you're filtering um, because the little uh, funnel up here will turn green and down at the bottom it says zero images, 42 hidden. So when I clicked on this fo folder I was still filtering, nothing showed up. Just turn off that filter, everything pops into view. Um, so that's a very quick look at the, at the pro photographer workflow. Click on a folder, do your rating, very quickly find your best photos, filter to only find those best ones, start doing your editing, and then create that, those output images, uh, and then it, deliver those to your client, and then move on to the next one. For enthusiast photos, or uh, enthusiast photographers, um, the asset management and cataloging components become a lot more important. Uh, at home, I've got a catalog of about 45,000 photos, and it's really, really handy to be able to use the, uh, the catalogs and the metadata browser here to help me find my best photos very quickly. So I'll walk through the workflow using um, the, the catalogs and metadata browser on the library tab here, and then when we're done, I'll uh, create a new catalog, import some images, um, and show you that process of how to set up a catalog um, and uh, how to use the, uh, the library tab. Um, some of the big advantages you get when using a library is that not only can you see a single photo, uh, a single folder of photos like, um, like this, that's just what we were doing in file system view, but you can also see multiple photos, so you, multiple folders, pardon me. Um, you can hold down the control key and select many of these. Um, I've got 521 images selected right now. Um, and instantly they pop on screen, you can move through them very, very quickly. Um, or you can see whole uh, sections uh, of, of photos. So here in this in the Seattle folder, I have this uh, recurse button checked. So it's going to show me everything in the Sa Seattle folder and all the folders underneath it as well. Um, so you could just pick your whole travel catalog and uh, 7,000 photos come up on the screen. You can move through them very, very quickly and, uh, and see your entire catalog. Um, now, 7,000 photos is, is pretty hard to, uh, to manage. That's a, that's a lot of photos, and, and finding a specific set of, of images out of that 7,000 can be pretty difficult. So we've built in the, a lot of capability into this metadata browser. What that allows you to do is to select photos, not based on what folder they are saved on your computer, uh, but rather uh, about other characteristics, maybe just the uh, two-star or the two and three star photos. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll actually select all of the one, two, and three star photos. That, that's a pretty good set. Um, and then I'm going to hit refine. What that does is it hides all the photos that I haven't already rated with one, two, or three star. That's a pretty good start. Now I'm down to, a, to 1,100 photos. But that's still too many. So what I'm going to do is open my keyword browser and say, okay, let's just find the good ones, the ones that I've rated with one or more stars that I shot in Honduras. Okay, that's, that's a much more manageable set. Now we're down to 150 photos. Uh, but that's still too many, so maybe I want to find the ones shot uh, just at high ISO, see if there are uh, any noise issues. Um, and very quickly, boom, that's, the, that's that nice sun sh sunset shot that I was looking for. Uh, or maybe you want to find the ones shot with a very wide-angle lens, that broad perspective. Uh, okay, that's the photo that I was looking for. So you can use a lot of different metadata together, both metadata that you add, like keywords and ratings, um, and metadata that, that Aftershot will find automatically, things like focal length, um, the make and model of the camera that you were using, uh, the time you shot, whether it's a RAW or JPEG file uh, or TIFF, um, lots of different characteristics, and you can use them all together. Um, what you can also do is add these refinement steps and remove them in any order. First I did uh, my one, two, and three star images, and then just the Honduras ones. I can back out Honduras and say, well, instead of that, let's see the, uh, the Cambodian ones. Uh, there, there are more photos there, and then hit that refinement. Um, but if I really want uh, to look at all my Cambodia photos, what I can do now is leave that one selected, but remove my rating refinement. So now I get my entire Cambodian set, 3,000 photos. Um, so you can add and remove, funnel, drill down on exactly what you want to do um, very, very quickly to find um, the photos that you're looking for. Um, and as I said, this is typically more relevant for um, enthusiasts, home users like myself, as opposed to the pro photographers that, that deliver their project, hand it off to the client, and then move on to the next one. 
But one of the key advantages of Aftershot compared to every other uh, workflow application out there is that we give you the choice. Uh, with Lightroom, you have to import images into a catalog just to see them. Um, and, and that's fine. A lot of people you know, don't mind that. But it's just an extra step for the people that don't need that cataloging capability. Um, so the, the wedding photographers have to create those catalogs even though they know they're never going to use it again. Um, it's also very handy to use the library and file system view together. So I can click on Oaxaca and quickly see all the photos that I shot in, in Mexico. But if a colleague brings over a memory card, um, yeah, I can stick it in my computer. It'll show up as a drive here. And I can quickly just say, oh, yeah, let's, let's go take a look at that. So without having to import those images into my catalog, I can use those images in, in Aftershot. And that's, that's something that's, that's very unique and very handy uh, when multiple photographers are working together. I don't have to clutter up my catalog with someone else's work just to be able to see the photos. So uh, we looked at um, a, a couple of different uh, workflows, one based around the file system for the pro photographer, the enthusiast workflow, searching, sorting, cataloging, using uh, the metadata browser, catalogs, and the library tool. What I'll do now is just uh, create a new library and show you that process of, of actually setting up uh, the asset management features. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to switch to file system view and uh, just right click on the images you want to import. I'll do the speed test folder and say import folder. Um, this dialog pops up. It says a source folder, speed test, that's the one I clicked on, import into catalog. Uh, I only have one catalog uh, in this uh, application so far, so I just have the, the one button here. But what I'm going to do is make a new one. So just click that button, hit new catalog, and then create a new folder here uh, called speed test. You can call it anything you want to. Um, and then select it, hit OK, and now it says that I'm going to import from the folder speed test into the catalog speed test. Um, and it's going to include all of the subfolders underneath speed test. These bottom two sections are where you can add uh, settings to the images as you import. So um, I can add a keyword uh, called aftershot is fast or whatever you want, speed test. Uh, if this was a, a specific uh, trip you went on or event, you could add that here. You can also add presets. Uh, at home, I have a preset for my copyright information, metadata about, about me, my website, uh, my copyright info. So you can apply that to all your photos as you import them here. Um, just hit the plus button. Um, a list of all your presets pop up, um, and you can add one of those. Um, but I'm not going to do that for this, for this purpose. I'm just going to import, um, hit OK. And then down in the bottom left, you'll see this little status. It's importing. It's creating previews. If I click on the library tab, there's my uh, speed test um, folder. And here are all the images being imported. If you scroll to the bottom, you can see the new ones being added. They just pop in that quickly. Um, once the import is done, it'll uh, continue previewing. So uh, what you see initially are the previews that are embedded in the raw file, uh, JPEG or TIFF file. And then it will move through those photos really quickly and replace that embedded preview with a rendered version. Here they come. Um, applying Aftershot's default settings uh, and, and converting a, a small version so you can see exactly what it'll look like uh, in Aftershot. Um, double click on a file, it'll pop right up, and then you can start editing right away. Um, and one thing you'll note is, is how responsive the application is. Over the webinar, there might be a little bit of lag, but th these are 24 megapixel raw files from Sony's uh, A900 camera. Great big files, uh, but you can move through them very, very quickly. And as soon as an image comes up, boom, you can start editing uh, Pac-Man uh, very, very quickly. So that's a, that's a great way to uh, import images into a catalog. I could then go back to a, another group of images and uh, say import. And um, that same catalog would be selected. So you can just import those right away. Uh, so you can add multiple photos to a catalog. You can come back time and time again and uh, keep building up those catalogs over time. Um, and then here you can see we've got my one big overall catalog with all my travel photos, this speed test catalog that, uh, that we just imported. And uh, down here in the metadata browser, um, there are uh, entries for, for both catalogs. So working with more than one catalog works just like one big catalog. Um, there's no difference. Um, it just allows you to group those photos together. 
once they're grouped like this, what you can do is use this link to catalog um, checkbox right here. What that does is shows you the metadata only for the photos that you've selected in the, uh, in the catalog view, so only for my speed test folder here. So instead of the uh, 7,000 photos in both catalogs, it's going to show you just the information for the, the speed test group. Um, so that's great if you if you shoot with lots of different cameras. Uh, so I can show you know there there are a whole bunch of cameras that I used in that um, in both catalogs, but in the speed test I only use three: the Sony, Nikon, and Canon. And very quickly you can move back and forth through these. So that's a way to to make the the metadata browser list and the counts next to each one of these 50 photos of each of these cameras. Um, makes those views a little bit more concise, a little more um, specific to just the photos you're looking for. That, that's a great way to, again, just to hone in on the, on the few photos that you're looking for out of your huge catalog of photos. So whether you're an enthusiast or a pro, final image quality is important to everybody. So we've packed in a huge array of image adjustment tools to allow you to do a very, very broad array of image adjustments, image optimization, while you're still working on your raw files very, very quickly. And one of the unique capabilities about Aftershot is the ability to do essentially any image adjustment, including third-party plugins, to either the whole image or any portion of the image. And we'll start out with a simple example of that with this photo here. Um, over on the right, it's nice and saturated. All these flowers, uh, the grass, um, pops pretty well. But on the left, it's very dull, it's very dim, and um, the whole photo looks a little unbalanced. If I add saturation, the left starts to look good, but the right just goes crazy. That's just, that's just silly looking, so that's not what I want to do at all. So instead, I'm just going to double click on saturation, to, uh, the, the word saturation here to reset that one, and then open up my layers manager here. That's what this little uh, um, icon here does. And what I will do is create a new adjustment layer, and then just very quickly select the left portion of this photo. So one click puts down one of these control points, two clicks stops editing, and then you can come in, and now when I add my saturation, it only applies inside my region over here. The flowers, the, what's outside my region, um, didn't show up at all. Um, I've still got the, uh, this um, um, polygon tool selected, this region creation tool selected, so my region is visible. If you push the space bar, That'll temporarily hide that region so you can see uh, how well you did, either matching up uh, tight angles or, or uh, precise por portions of your image. Um, or you can click down here on the hand to switch to a different um, cursor mode to hide that altogether. Um, H is also a good shortcut key to do that. So very quickly, you can apply essentially any image adjustment setting to either the whole photo or any portion of the photo. So it's very quick to allow you to get beautiful looking results out of your images really quickly. And, and I said you can do essentially any image adjustment in Aftershot. Uh, and here's an example of one that you can't. Uh, this was shot by Judy Haley. She's a wedding pro out of uh, LA. And uh, she shot this wedding with this fisheye lens because she wanted this sort of warping global feel shooting off this balcony here. Um, and that's great. Uh, you can obviously do that if you want to. But we also give you the uh, tools to um, do lens distortion correction and give you a nice rectilinear image if that's the feel you're looking for. Um, the application already knew what camera, what lens, what focal length this was shot at. And it's got a huge catalog of hundreds of, of different lenses and knows um, exactly, whoop, click the wrong button there, exactly um, what sort of image distortion that this lens will create. Uh, and, and this is one of those image adjustments that doesn't really make sense to do only to a portion of an image. So if I were to create a new layer, you would see that the lens distortion becomes disabled because it's not possible to apply that to, uh, um, to a region. Um, you have to do that to the, to the overall image. Um, but essentially everything else in the application can be done um, either to the whole image or a portion of the image. And we'll look at an example um, here. So I shot this in Tibet several years ago, and I really like the color of the sky, this sort of early evening um, light blue sky. And I like the subject matter of the foreground, this man taking a photo of his family in front of this monument. 
but it's so dark down here, um, the white balance is off um, in the bottom, so it's kind of murky, and overall the image doesn't have a whole lot of impact, and, and it's not really that great. If I go do my little one-click white balance adjustment like this, um, click I to select the eyedropper, or uh, right here on the uh, uh, white balance tool on the, uh, on the right column, the, the bottom of the image starts to look good, but I lost the characteristic of the sky, which is one of the whole reasons I took this photo in the first place. So that's not going to work. What I want to do instead is create a region. I will just uh, add an adjustment layer um, and then use my polygon tool here just to click, click, whoops, missed, click, and click and select the bottom of this photo very quickly. Take my white balance eyedropper, click again, and boom. The bottom por portion of my image takes on that n uh, nice clear white balance, but I didn't lose that characteristic of the sky that was important to me in the first place. Um, with this layer still, adjust, uh, still selected, I will go add a little bit of fill light. So you can add multiple image adjustments to a single layer and, uh, and get very precise control over your photos very, very quickly. Uh, turn back on the layer manager. You can turn that on and off to see how well you did. Uh, you can also adjust the opacity. So maybe you want to do uh, all those adjustments but not quite so strong. Have some of that original shine through. You can do that as well. Uh, now, I was a little bit lazy when I made that polygon. If I uh, double click right here to zoom, I will see that I cut off the top of the stairs here. The bottom looks good. The, stop, the, the top starts to look like that original um, cool blue. I, I could make another region, another polygon up there to select that, but instead I'm just going to use my paintbrush. Uh, just select the paintbrush cursor and click and drag and uh, paint over the areas you want to be adjusted, and instantly that will get added to, to your main region here. So you have the adjustment layer, your big polygon at the bottom, and then this little brushed area right there. So both of these regions are part of the same layer, so they take on those same characteristics, the white balance, the, the fill light. Very, very quickly you get precise control over your photos uh, without a lot of fuss. Um, now what you can do, I'll come back to my thumbnail view. Actually, I'll go to, to this view here. And um, I'm going to right-click on this photo and say version, um, new version from defaults. So what that's going to do is create a second version uh, and apply my default settings. I'll just rotate this around. So this is a very quick way to compare your before and after. I'll select them both, hit M to go into multi-view, and uh, we'll hide that panel as well. Um, so quickly you can see what we started out with and what we ended up with and uh, how much better a photo that was in just a few, uh, few seconds, a few clicks. Um, Aftershot has a very, very broad range of image adjustment tools. Uh, another one of the more popular ones is our uh, noise reduction tools. Indoor sports is one of the hardest shooting conditions. You've got low light, poor quality light, high speed motion, and uh, it really is, is hard on equipment uh, and shows off the, uh, the, the flaws of, of any of the, the processing. Um, I'll hit E to open my little uh, metadata browser, E for EXIF. And you'll see that this was shot with the original Canon 1D uh, at ISO 3200. So, yep, it's noisy. There's noise up here in the shadows. There's noise in the foreground. And uh, overall, this, this looks pretty bad. Um, we've got a couple of uh, noise adjustment controls here. One's called raw noise. That runs very, very early in the processing pipeline and does a great initial pass only on raw files um, to, to attack that noise and, and to give you a much better looking photo overall. And then I'm going to turn, in, turn on Noise Ninja as well, and maybe just back off on that strength of both of these just a little bit like that. And so this lets you balance uh, noise reduction versus detail, and very, very quickly you can get uh, a great looking photo out of something that looked like a throwaway image uh, in just a couple of clicks. So again, I'm just going to hit Control-C to copy those image settings. If I move on over to my next image, zoom into 100%, you can see it was shot at the same time, same lighting, so it has those same characteristics. Hit Control-V, those settings get applied, that noise goes away, and I've got great looking photos very, very quickly. So this is a, a super way to move through a huge number of images without having to adjust each one individually. Just click, 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 boom, you get beautiful results right away. 
a, a less severe example of the noise reduction is uh, seen in this photo here. First of all, I don't like blue snow, so I'm going to click my white balance cursor right here, click on something that's nice and neutral like the snow, and we get a, a more natural uh, color cast. Double click to zoom in to 100% though, and you can see all that noise. Noise here in the sky, uh, noise in the shadows. Uh, there's still some fine detail. These, these uh, tree branches, the fence posts, um, all that detail is still visible, but this noise is, is pretty distracting. So again, just one click on Noise Ninja, and I get beautiful, smooth skies. All that detail is preserved. I can still read the street sign. All the fine detail is still intact, uh, but I get a much better looking image very, very quickly. You can also use Aftershot to do the bulk of your image adjustments, the raw file conversion, those sorts of things, um, but then launch Paint Shop or Photoshop or um, an external editor to do very detailed retouching or maybe to composite multiple photos together. Um, what I'll do is start with this photo here, maybe we'll add a little bit of saturation to really make the colors pop, um, add a lot of contrast. Um, I could fix the vignetting um, using this vignette tool here and the little um, tone fall off in the, uh, in the corners. But what I'm going to do is just actually add a little bit more vignette, just like that, just to be a little creative with it. Um, okay, that's starting to look pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is right-click here, and uh, at the top of this menu, it'll say Edit with uh, Paint Shop Pro. I could also hit Control-E, which is the shortcut. What that's going to do is uh, create an output file, this uh, TIFF image here, and it's going to load up uh, Paint Shop, and it's going to bring in that photo. Now I can do any of the image adjustments that Paint Shop or Photoshop are great for. Um, I'll just do something uh, very uh, quick and obvious here. I'll, I'll add a, a photo frame. Um, but you could use this to composite multiple files together, to add text, to uh, um, cut out the background and copy and paste these flowers into another frame, uh, anything you want to do. Um, I'll just uh, save this photo here, flatten it, pop back over to Aftershot, and boom, it updates almost instantly with the adjustments that I've done in the, in the external editor. Uh, if you go to the Preferences window here, under File, Preferences, you can see there's a section for the external editor. This is where you uh, pick which application you want to be your editor. Um, this could be Paint Shop or Photoshop, anything you want. Um, so that's a great way to define uh, not only the application you want to use as an external editor, but some of the characteristics of the file you'll be sending it, whether it's an 8-bit or 16-bit TIFF, uh, what color space you want to put it in, uh, and, and the DPI. One thing I'll point out on the Preferences panel while we're here is uh, this keyboard section. So I've been using lots of different hotkeys and shortcuts um, during this uh, webinar, and they're all listed here. And uh, you can also edit them or change them to other things. So I could uh, create, uh, let's see, Alt-B to apply a blue color label to an image just like that. Um, hit OK, then back on this image, hit Alt-B, and uh, I've added my blue color label to it. So you can, uh, you can customize these. You can add, add your own keywords uh, or add your own uh, shortcuts. Uh, but that's a good way to reference uh, what keys do what commands. So I think I've uh, gone through uh, a lot of the basics, uh, things that I wanted to touch on. Um, Evelyn, do we want to open it up to questions now? That sounds perfect. Uh, for anyone, I do have some questions already put into the panel, but uh, if you do have any, the questions panel on the uh, right side of your screen, the webinar panel, feel free to type in any of the questions there so we can make sure to include those. Uh, the first one uh, we have, Jeff, is uh, a little more about um, uh, cataloging, mm -hmm. just about having external drives or being able to transfer catalogs from one system to another. Sure. Um, what you'll notice is uh, when I created the catalog, um, it, it asked for a, a place to, to store it. So I'll go catalog, new catalog again. And um, these are just on my C drive. Um, but I could have created a catalog on, um, on an external drive. I've got this offline backup uh, USB drive. Um, so the catalogs can be stored separately from the raw files, the master files that they're actually importing into that catalog, or you can put them together. So um, if I were moving back and forth between work and home, for example, I want to have one catalog, 
uh, with all those photos and I want to use that same catalog from both machines. So that would be a good reason to put the catalog on the external drive with the photos. So just create a new catalog right here, say folder, um, my catalog, uh, let's go ahead and spell it correctly. Um, and then boom, and, and there it is. So now when I import those photos from that hard drive into that catalog, um, when I'm done, I can just close down the application, unplug that hard drive, take it home with me, plug it in, start up after shot, and then say file, open catalog, and navigate to where that, uh, that drive is, is selected, plug it in, and um, it, it'll pop right in, and, and I can continue to work on it just like that. Um, for these other catalogs, the, I have the catalog on my computer, um, but the photos are either uh, local or on a, on a network drive, and, and it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, you can use local files, you can use uh, files over a network. Um, remember that these raw files are pretty big, and for the ones you use uh, that you access quite a bit, um, AfterShot will be a lot more responsive if those files are on a local fast hard drive. Uh, but you can keep the files together, you can keep the, the catalog separate, and that, that allows you a lot of flexibility with how you want to store and, and, uh, and use all those different uh, cataloging capabilities. Uh, Jeff, we have a question about, and I know you've already mentioned it throughout the webinar a little bit, but uh, can you just uh, summarize again what, what are some of the special things that AfterShot does that's not available in other photo workflow software? Absolutely. Um, well, while we're talking about catalogs, that, that's one big thing. Um, App, a, a lot of other applications require you to use a catalog and they require you to use only one at a time. Um, so I couldn't have this catalog that's on external media and this catalog of my speed test photos and another catalog of my uh, travel photos um, all together um, being used at the same time. I'd have to use one at a time. Um, and uh, I also have the ability to use the uh, file system view if I just want to quickly click on a folder. I don't want to import them. I don't want to, to add these to my catalog. I just want to quickly take a look at these photos. Um, so that's one of the unique capabilities uh, in things like a in, in Lightroom. Uh, you get one catalog. You have to use it. You can't click on file system view. You have to do that importing process and wait for that to, to finish before you, you use your photos. Um, so we're a lot more flexible uh, in how you use the application. Uh, and then also uh, one of the other big differentiating characteristics is the, uh, the selective editing. Um, so we can do essentially anything um, and we can create um, uh, very uh, detailed shapes about the, about the areas you want to edit. So what I can do is take a photo like this and uh, uh, Stephen Eastwood took this. He's a glamour photographer out of uh, New York and you can see the little light fall off uh, as, as uh, this model was being illuminated from her, her right. What I'm going to do is just kind of follow the contour of that shadow just like this and then select the background here because what I want to do is emphasize that shadow just a little bit more. So with that region selected I'll hit H to hide, the, uh, hide that region and just drop my exposure down just a little bit more to really emphasize that light fall off. So anything you want to do, you can do it very precisely. No other application allows you to get that precise control um, following the contours of that shadow. I'll add a little bit of feathering here just to make that, that blend a little bit better. Um, and very quickly, you get very, very precise control um, out of those image adjustments. One of the other unique capabilities is the way that we support plugins. I talked about this at the beginning, but uh, we'll go into it in a, in a little more detail here. Let's find another photo, like maybe, um, uh, well, any of these. We'll, we'll just take this one. So plugins in AfterShot work just like a built-in tool. Um, they run within the pipeline, within the application. You don't have to do your editing with the built-in tools first and then apply your plugins. You can do these in any order, any way you want to. Um, and I'll focus on this uh, black and white plugin. This ships with the application, so everybody will have access to it. Um, the other plugins, as I said, you can find on aftershotpro.com slash plugins. Um, but plugins just work like any other application uh, or any other tool in the application. Just uh, turn it on, maybe move through these uh, different options, get something uh, about like that, and... Um, your plugin settings are applied very quickly. Now, if I go back to any of the built-in tools and make changes here, 
I don't have to reapply or send the photo to the plugin again like you would in, in uh, Aperture or, or Lightroom. Um, it's, it's a built-in tool. It works just like anything else. You can use it in conjunction with the other um, tools built into the application very quickly. You can also copy and move to the next image, paste the settings from plugins as well. So that's a great way to build a single workflow out of lots of different technology, not only the ones built into the application, but also the, the third-party um, plugins. I'll hit Control-R to reset. This will pop back to exactly how it was uh, straight out of the camera. And um, what I'll show you is that you can also use the plugins in regions. Now, it doesn't really make sense for uh, this plugin, but what I'll do is uh, just kind of click around and select this uh, model's uh, head, and then turn on my black and white plugin. Um, so very, very quickly, you can see that the third-party plugins fully participate in our copy and paste, undo, redo, presets, and uh, the, uh, the selective editing capability. Um, no other application allows you that much flexibility and freedom. Okay, uh, the next question we have is about uh, camera support. How do I find out uh, if my camera is supported? Do you also support um, other formats uh, like video, for instance? Good question. Um, so over here, I'll bring my browser back over. If you go to krell.com uh, slash aftershot, and you just type in uh, aftershot, it'll take you to this page here. Um, and on it, you'll see the uh, button for tech specs. Scroll down, and here's a list of all the supported uh, raw file formats that we support. Right now, I think it's about 230, 240 different camera models that we support. Each camera model is a little bit different. Um, all of the Canon cameras, they shoot raw files that end in the .CR2 extension. But that doesn't mean that they're all the same. Each model is different. Every time a new camera comes out, we have to profile it for color, profile it for noise, um, if it's a new camera or a new model, perhaps um, actually do some raw file decoding and figure out how, where the uh, image data and all the metadata is embedded in that raw file. So it's not an immediate process that when new cameras come out, they immediately get supported. Uh, but we try to keep uh, updates out there very, very quick. Um, and we're working on some updates right now for some of the new cameras just announced at CES a few weeks ago. Uh, so this is a list of all the raw file formats we support. We also support TIFFs and JPEGs. Um, and uh, right now we don't support video files, um, but we're hearing lots of requests for that, and that's something that we're uh, definitely uh, um, looking at to, to add in the future. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Um, now, you showed a little bit about editing of batches. Can you go back and talk more about output batches, uh, such as file renaming or um, being able to customize those options that we see? Absolutely. Um, so if, if you're renaming files, um, you have a couple of different choices. You can rename the original raw file and then by default in the batch it uses um, these uh, rename formats um, and the default one is VName or version name and then the output extension for this, for this would be JPEG. So if I were to send uh, this photo here um, to this batch it would be called, um, the final output file would be called 0 one nine underscore six underscore thirty five dash thirty five zero. Not a very uh, meaningful name. Um, I can rename a single file um, by uh, hitting F2 or, or from the uh, edit menu, go edit version, uh, oops, version, uh, rename version. And if you just type in a name here, um, that will rename the a file on your computer. Um, and then all the output files will also get named as well. You can select all the photos um, and do that same process, version rename and you can use sequences um, so if I call this uh, new name SEQ um, you'd see that it, it's going to call this new name hyphen one um, you can add um, padding say so three SEQ would be a three digit sequence number that's going to restart each time you rename uh, and if you look in the help file if you hit F1 uh, or go online and, and look in the, in the help file, it'll explain all of these uh, renaming uh, formats to help you get the exact right uh, uh, name uh, that, that you're looking for. So that's how you can rename the master file and the versions created from it in the output batches. Uh, as I said, the default is to name it 
um, just whatever the, the version name in AfterShot is called. But you can also name it um, you know, with, with the date or date and time um, or uh, give it a, a batch sequence name. So you can rename just the output files. This can be a, a little bit uh, complicated though. If you rename your output files different than something that's actually in the ap application, if you need to match those two up later, it can, be, uh, it can be hard to figure out exactly which image that output came from. So I recommend uh, doing your renaming on the files in your computer and then have the output files carry on those same names. Okay, thanks Jeff. Um, I think we have time for probably a couple more questions. Um, there's a, a couple about um, some of the output options that we have now we're planning. There's a, I noticed that there's a slideshow option. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that is uh, offering? Yeah, the slideshow is just a very quick way to uh, show an on-screen slideshow um, of the photos. You can uh, give it a custom title, you can add uh, some metadata information. This is handy if you use um, captions. You can, you can run a caption underneath your slideshow. Um, and uh, so this is a handy way just to set up some very, very basic, uh, very quick slideshow. Have this run in the background. You can put this on a second monitor um, and uh, hide some of this uh, um, uh, details like that. So you hit play and it would just scroll through either all the selected photos um, or the whole uh, catalog uh, or uh, folder of photos uh, and just kind of move through them one by one. These slideshows are um, not an output file. It's not something that you can share. It's just something that runs within AfterShot. Uh, we're looking at doing some of those uh, you know, output slideshow capability uh, in an update down the road. Um, but as far as the output matches, you can uh, create three different kinds of outputs. Um, most of these batches here just create uh, what's called a file output, uh, just an image. So this, this uh, JPEG proof batch that we've used a couple of times creates one file. It's a JPEG with 80% uh, quality uh, with, uh, with this resizing turned on. Um, but I can have one batch create multiple files. Uh, so what I'll do here is I'll make this one full size and I'll put it into a folder called full. I'll make another one over here and um, we'll make it real small. So let's do 640 by 640 um, and we'll put it in a subfolder called preview uh, and then let's do one more and um, black and white. So what I'll do here is do a full size image but I will add a preset um, click my plus button and a list of all my presets pop up and I'll just take this uh, simple black and white right there and uh, add it to my list of presets to apply only to this output. So now this one is called J JPEG multi images. Um, okay, done. So now if I take uh, these photos and drag it to my uh, multi images batch it's going to start processing those and let me just pull up a file browser and I'll show you uh, what that's doing. If I go to my desktop and then output you can see that um, it created these three folders one called black and white and it stuck my black and white images in there um, this is, these were my full-size images and those were my previews. Uh, these were all the uh, other photos that we did earlier in the demo I'll just delete those um, and then if we come in here and uh, select the rest of these photos, scroll down to the end, and we'll just add that in here, boom. And then we can see uh, those will just be added um, as, as the batch processes. So this is a great way to automate your workflow and do some very simple things. Um, add the presets to get black and white versions from your files very, very quickly. So if you tune those presets and get them looking exactly like you want to, this is a great way, particularly for wedding photographers that want to deliver a color image, maybe a sepia tone, do some du duo-toned images, um, and some monochrome images very, very quickly. Um, they can have one batch that does all that at the same time. Great, thanks Jeff. Uh, we're almost out of time, so um, the last one of course is um, the pricing and availability for AfterShot. 
Sure. So if I switch back over to uh, a web browser, you can see that it's available right now. Uh, if you go to after uh, corel.com slash aftershot, you can buy it. Uh, $99. Uh, this is the download only version. Uh, the boxes in the uh, in the states are available right now, and I think they're becoming available uh, around the world um, also very shortly. Um, it's uh, localized in uh, English, German, French, Italian, Dutch, and Japanese. Uh, and if you have other um, um, uh, applications like uh, Bibble 5 or Paint Shop, um, X2 or, or later, um, or Lightroom or Aperture, you're also eligible to get this upgrade pricing, um, which makes it uh, a, an even better deal. Normally $99 with the uh, uh, upgrade, uh, you get it for $79, which is, a, which is a great deal. And here's the last question. Um, are we going to be doing more of these webinars? Uh, absolutely. We, we just launched this application uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and this is our first round of webinars about it. Um, but uh, I hope to be able to do these um, maybe monthly uh, on lots of different topics, talking about things like uh, optimizing your workflow for using Aftershot, image editing, um, selective editing, uh, lots of different uh, detailed capabilities for the application. Uh, maybe get some of the third-party uh, plugin developers to uh, to actually come in, join us, and uh, show us a little bit about how they develop their their plugins and how those work in, inside the application. So, if folks have ideas for workshops or things they want to hear, um, please let us know about that uh, either through the questions um, or uh, Facebook, any of the other uh, channels to get in communication with us. Perfect, and that reminds me to let everyone know that uh, uh, at the end of this uh, session, uh, you'll be presented with a very short survey, uh, and in there, it uh, there's an option to and it'll give us ideas if there's any topics that you want covered. Uh, a lot of the webinars and, and stuff that we present is very much driven by uh, user input and suggestions, so let us know what you guys want to see, and uh, we'll make sure to deliver that for you so you can get the most out of Aftershot. So we're out of time. Jeff, thank you very much for walking us through this. My pleasure. Um, and uh, I'll be uh, posting a recording of this session, so we can all, uh, anyone who wants to take another look at it or may have missed it can come back at, uh, to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be posting a link um, to our Facebook page. But the uh, Aftershot uh, YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com slash Corel Aftershot Pro. And uh, you guys should see a link to that recording uh, later today. So with that, I just want to thank everyone very much for coming out, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, Jeff. Cheers. Thanks a lot.